Welcome to the healthiest half hour ish anywhere online today. Hi, this is the exam room live and I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for taking a little bit of time out of your day to join us here on Facebook and YouTube. Everybody here at the physicians committee greatly appreciate the fact that you are here. On tap today, we have a big show and there is a major story unfolding in Wuhan, China, ground zero for the coronavirus. Big changes coming there to meat markets and animal breeding. We're going to fill you in on exactly what's happening. Plus, as states to continue to reopen, there are signs now that a second wave of infections may be coming. Some cities already experiencing a tenfold increase in cases and if you're like a lot of people and have been wiping down your groceries and packages, disinfecting them as you bring them into the house, we're learning more about your risk of becoming infected by them. Plus, Dr. Neil Barnard is here with a look at a medication that is dominating the headlines right now. Will it or won't it help in the fight against COVID-19? Dr. Barnard, looking forward to getting your thoughts. You bet. And we're going to be taking a look at the new dietary guidelines that are right now under review when dietitian Susan Levin joins us. What could this big update mean for the way that the nation views food? Susan, looking forward to getting your thoughts. Me too. Thanks, Chuck. And then both Susan and Dr. Barnard, they're going to be teaming up and answering your questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and post them in the comments section. Now we're going to get to as many as we possibly can by the end of the show when we open up the doctor's mailbag. So go ahead and start posting those questions right now. But let's get things started today with the check on headlines and five things that you need to know for Thursday, May 21st, 2020. The number of cases of COVID-19 since the pandemic began now stands at more than 5 million, with roughly 30% of them right here in the U.S., where more than 93,000 people have died. The global death toll is rapidly approaching 330,000. If you've been disinfecting all of the groceries and packages that you've been bringing into the house, it takes a long time, doesn't it? Well, you're probably going to want to listen to this. The CDC now says that the coronavirus does not spread easily from touching surfaces or objects. However, the agency also cautions that although it does not appear to be the main way the virus spreads, it may still be possible to become infected if you touch a surface that has been infected and then touch your nose, your mouth, or your eyes. The CDC, though, maintains that the virus is highly contagious through simple person-to-person -person contact, such as standing within six feet of someone who is infected and then getting the droplets that are expelled when a person coughs or sneezes or even talks. They then get inhaled by the next person, and that person then becomes infected and spreads it to the next person and so on. On the screen right there, you see all the ways that person-to-person -person transmission is to be expected. Meanwhile, the CDC keeping busy, it is also in the early stages of a massive study on the prevalence of coronavirus antibodies. Researchers will be testing some 325,000 people, hoping the results will shed light on the exact nature of the way the virus is spreading, including through those who never display any symptoms. Meanwhile, health experts are fearing a second wave of infections will overcome portions of the South and the Midwest where officials are aggressively reopening their economies, pointing specifically to Dallas and Houston and portions of Florida, as well as the entire state of Alabama. Some areas already experiencing a staggering resurgence in cases since reopening, including Crawford County, Iowa, which is up 750 percent, and Colfax County, Nebraska, where cases have spiked by nearly 14 1,500%, according to the Washington Post. Officials say because the incubation period for the virus can take up to two weeks and people then delay seeking medical treatment, it may take up to a month to get an accurate idea of just how the reopening of the country will affect the spread of the virus. And finally, some big news out of Wuhan, China, where eating wild animals is being outlawed. The global coronavirus is believed to have began at the so-called wet market there last year. And additionally, officials are offering farmers money to stop breeding those ex animal, exotic animals that are being sold in those markets. And hunting within the city has also been banned, according to multiple reports. Officials now call the city of about 11 million 
a wildlife sanctuary. Now that you're all caught up on headlines, let's catch up with Dr. Barnard. And Dr. Barnard, right there in Wuhan, that has got to be some really welcome news. Officials making huge changes after being pressured to shut down these markets and the underground wildlife trade there. I have to say, Chuck, I really think that's the way to do it. Um, we had a, a similar situation in some ways uh, back about 20 years ago with tobacco farmers. Um, tobacco obviously became... It was quite clearly linked to lung cancer and several other forms of the disease. And yet you had people whose livelihoods depended on various aspects of the tobacco industry. So what did the government do? They took the attitude that these were honest people who got involved in growing tobacco probably generations ago. And rather than just say, all right, you're stuck, they kind of bought them out. Um, they found ways to transition them to, to other crops. And I think that if what's happened in Wuhan is you say, all right, here are these people running these markets. Let's just make an economic decision that we're going to shift them in a different direction. And I think what we need to do here is to do that more broadly. Um, the people who have gotten involved in the livestock industries, the people who are, running, who are running the slaughterhouses, they're not bad people. They got into businesses before all of these risks became clear. And I think we need to make it economically uh, appropriate to give them a golden parachute. So I hope something like that can happen here because we need to find ways to move people away from seeing meat as somehow essential. Uh, by the way, Chuck, can I give you the, the latest situation, the latest numbers here in DC, um, if you don't mind? Uh, by all means, yes. As of May 1st, we thought we were starting to see the corner turn. Uh, back, in, back in April, we had 140, what you're seeing on your screen is the average number of cases every day. Can you see this? Is that yep. there? Yep, sure okay. is. All right, uh, April 10th, we had 147 new cases per day that week. And then it looked like it was kind of going down a little bit. So we thought, okay, here in Washington, just like every other city, we're starting to win. Then what happened? In the last couple of weeks, uh, things have been going back up. So I have to tell you, we have not yet turned the corner on this. And the other thing, as you mentioned, Chuck, in the introduction, was talking about hydroxychloroquine. Uh, let me review where we were with this and then give you some new information. Um, it started with a drug chloroquine. Uh, and in Brazil, they did a high dose, low dose study of this, of chloroquine. And what they found is that in the high dose group, they had a lot of deaths. These are COVID patients, came in and got the one of the two doses and the high dose was killing the people. So they stopped the high dose uh, trial and stuck with the low dose. And the problem was ventricular tachycardia, among other conditions. This is where the heart just starts beating out of control. And that's what can happen when people are taking this, this uh, family of drugs, is that your heart rhythm can become dis disordered and you can die. Uh, Sweden stopped uh, chloroquine use altogether. Okay, then you've heard me talk about this. Let me see if I can advance my screen. How do you like this? My, my, okay, there we go. Um, chloroquine was adapted, can be adopted, adapted to this drug hydroxychloroquine. And hydroxychloroquine, the difference is right in the upper right, you see that OH group, that's a hydroxyl group. Uh, it makes it a little bit uh, safer, it was the idea. So the VA Veterans Administration then reported on 368 male patients. Here's what they found. Those people just getting usual care, not getting the drug, they got the COVID, 11% died. Then the people who took hydroxychloroquine and uh, azithromycin, 22% uh, died, and those people getting just the hydroxychloroquine alone, 28% died. So that threw cold water on this, and everyone was deciding maybe we'd, we don't need to be going this route at all. Uh, however, it was not a randomized trial. We still don't have a uh, good result from a randomized trial, but here's what we do have now. Um, JAMA just put out these uh, new data from a study in New York State, and it was much bigger than the VA study. Now, uh, it was well over 1,000 patients, 1,438 uh, patients. It was still observational. These are people who came in and were either treated with it or not treated with it. It was not randomized. But what they, they looked at was taking hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, or neither one. The people who had COVID but got neither one had a mortality of 13%. The people who got the hydroxychloroquine had a 20% mortality the people who got both drugs, 26% mortality. Now, uh, don't sell the farm based on these data yet because 
these groups are not really equivalent. It could be that a, a sicker person was loaded up on all of these drugs. It's not a randomized placebo controlled trial. But the conclusion for now has to be that there is no really appreciable benefit from either hydroxychloroquine used alone or used in combination. And if anything, there is a signal that this drug could kill you in certain situations. So uh, stay tuned, more to come on that. Back to you, Chuck. Dr. Bronner, before we move on and bring Susan Levin into the conversation, I want to go back to uh, the trends in the coronavirus cases. I think right now the country is divided into three groups of people. You have the people who say, we're reopening, we're being lulled into a false sense of security, let's wait a couple of weeks, see how those numbers progress. You have the other group of people who are like, the strong will survive mentality, or maybe I'm just immune to the disease, let's just go ahead and you know full throttle right now 100% everybody back to work, everybody back to eat, uh, let's just go. And then you have this third group of people, and this is who I want to talk to, who just don't quite know what to make of any of this. What would your message be to that group whose head is just spinning and don't know where to turn, what to, what to believe? Yeah, I, well, I think it's very reasonable because we're all learning about this together. And keep in mind that our view of this has really changed. The view initially was this is a dangerous virus could land you in the hospital. So the whole idea of flattening the curve was just to keep hospitals from getting overwhelmed. So stay at home, wear a mask, flatten the curve does not, at that time, did not mean you weren't gonna get the virus. It meant don't get it all at the same time now in March or April or whenever it was. Now people are viewing it a little bit differently. They're looking at these mortality figures approaching 100,000 here in the United States um, and many more worldwide thinking, I don't want to flatten the curve. Uh, I, I don't want to get the, 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 the disease at all. And here all bets are really off. I think it's really quite clear that the infections are going to continue. You will be at risk. Reopening will almost, well, not almost, reopening will certainly expose new people to the virus and will lead to more deaths uh, and more cases. The question is, um, what is the public will? with regard to just staying at home and and and, uh, uh, and not taking any risk at all. There's gonna be a huge push against that. So what I think is gonna happen is we're gonna see the virus continue to wane. That will embolden people. They will continue, I think this opening up is gonna happen even here in DC to a degree. And then we will start to see either uh, continuing down that, that path or as many have predicted, a resurgence. And then the resurgence will either be tolerated uh, without locking down again, or we'll see another lockdown. All right. Real talk, Dr. Barnard. I appreciate that. Stick around. We're going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. Question for Dr. Barnard or my next guest, dietitian Susan Levin. Go ahead and post that in the comments section now. But right now, let's move on. Every five years, the dietary guidelines that drive the way much of the country views food are updated. They're supposed to reflect the current body of nutrition science that provides advice for millions of Americans as far as what to eat, what to drink, and lowering the risk of disease. And 2020, this is one of the years where the guidelines will be getting an overhaul. And someone working closely to monitor what will and won't be in there is dietitian Susan Levin. Susan, thanks so much for joining us again here on The Exam Room. Thanks for having me, Chuck. Let's start by asking what type of an overhaul are we expecting here? Is it going to be something substantial? Well, you never really know because the process is kind of interesting. You have a committee who is nominated um, by the public and then selected by the USDA and the Department of Health. They co-manage the whole process. And in theory, they should be um, unbiased academic types who make recommendations for updating the guidelines. And this is a mandate uh, that Congress has put forth. This has to happen um, at least every five years. So um, in theory, the overhaul should just be catching up to or analyzing the new, um, all the new data or new science publications. They have certain rules for what they'll look like. Um, and it just kind of depends. It depends not only who's on the committee, 
possible biases within that committee. Um, and then the ultimate filter, which is the USDA. And the USDA has its own agenda, its own mandates to support agriculture. So it's hard to say what will get through um, from committee to guidelines and some surprises sometimes what maybe should have gotten through but didn't or did get through and shouldn't have. So it, it just kind of depends um, on the administration, who's running the USDA, who's running HHS and the committee members. Also, there's a lot, there's a lot at play. So not, not quite the simple answer anybody was expecting or hoping for. Well, quite all right. you know, we, we've talked so much, we've talked extensively on this show about the underlying conditions and the risk of COVID-19, everything from diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, all of that stuff. And so that, of course, tied so very closely to diet. And a lot of those conditions also tied to the consumption of dairy. So what are you hearing about what changes may be coming in terms of the guidance they're going to say about dairy? Well, I... I think it's really important that, and we have been doing this as have other um, people um, and groups, which is to try to get the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee and ultimately the guidelines to recognize that dairy is not an essential food um, or product. It is not, not only is it not necessary, it actually comes with some risks, whether it be um, mild risks like lactose intolerance, the people with lactose intolerance, what they might experience when they drink milk or have dairy products, which could be anything from upset stomach to, to diarrhea, um, not, not pleasant things. And when you consider that most humans are actually lactose intolerant, then this is a very relevant conversation to be having. But then you also have other longer term risks associated with dairy consumption, including certain cancers like breast cancer and prostate cancer, um, no apparent benefit with dairy consumption and bone health, uh, and the fact that dairy is the number one source of saturated fat in an American's diet. There's a lot at play with dairy and reasons why it just shouldn't be so prominently pushed or recommended to the point where most Americans actually think you need milk and it's a healthful product, which is just industry, um, industry talk basically, but yet it's so prominent, right? I think what we need to do is keep pushing, and we've been doing this for for months, if not I mean, years, trying to get the committee to catch up to this fact. And one, one ray of light I've seen is in Canada, where their dietary guidelines um, have, have reduced the prominent role of dairy products in their recommendations because they recognize that their population are not just um, lactose persistent people from Northern Europe who can actually digest milk products, but they have a diverse population and this is not a good product for most people. And I'm, 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 I'm emboldened that they took that step to, to put people over industry. So I'm hopeful that someday America will catch up, uh, the United States will catch up and do something similar to that. And there's so many voices who have been out there this particularly this round, making that exact case that this is not, not only not a necessary food, but it is a very potentially extremely harmful food, possibly deadly for some. Um, and we need to stop pretending that this is something we need to be consuming. I guess same question then when it comes to meat, obviously hypertension is the leading comorbidity in terms of COVID-19. High blood pressure tied so very closely, especially to processed meat that's loaded with salt and sodium. So what kind of changes are we expecting in terms of meat? Do you feel like the advisory committee has been receptive to the message on that? Um, yeah, well, here's what I think. I think you, no matter what your bias when you come into the committee, um, and mind you, the beef industry has has uh, bragged that they got two of their nominees on the committee. Um, we have someone who was nominated by Atkins on the committee. So they certainly come in with their, uh, you know, we can presume there's some biases there. Um, however, it is so hard to ignore the evidence for plant-based eating. And we saw this in the last committee, the last uh, five years ago, when we were doing this um, for the 2020, what, 2015 to 2020 guidelines, we saw them come out and say 
Well, you know, there's so much evidence that eating a vegetarian or plant-based dietary pattern is one of the healthiest ways to eat. You just can't, you can't really skirt around what's so obvious, thankfully, because there's so many eyes on this whole process. Um, and I think they're not going to be able to, again, when they look at dietary patterns, they're not going to be able to ignore the science. What I do fear is through the next filter, the filter of the USDA, who again, just like with dairy, they have a mandate to prop up agriculture, especially uh, oftentimes the most, the ones with the most, the deepest pockets, which are meat, beef, pork, chicken, these these industry giants have a huge sway over what the USDA will allow to come out to the public. So they're very hesitant and historically have been very hesitant to say meat is dangerous. They might say favor fruits and vegetables and watch out for saturated fat and cholesterol. And that just kind of falls on ears that are like, I don't know what that means. What is it? Yeah, I know how to eat more fruits and vegetables. I don't know how to eat less saturated fat and cholesterol because they just won't come out and say, oh, by the way, saturated fat and cholesterol predominantly in our diets found in meat products, animal products. So I kind of don't think this is the particular round, nor are we in the administration that is going to take that leap into more um, direct scientific lang language. But um, I'm always hopeful that the committee will make the right decisions and the public will hear about them. Um, and then the public can kind of compare what the USDA decided to print versus the evidence that we know to be true. Final question before we open up the mailbag. What is the timetable for this? When can we expect to see these updates rolled out? Yeah, so very. this is very timely because we expect the report to be released on June 8th, so a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Um, they're actually still taking public comments online, if you want, before June 1st. Of course, you know, with the report coming out soon after that, I don't know how much power that's going to have. But once the report is out, they will cert most certainly open up comments again to what the report says. And we're watching this very carefully. Um, PCRM will be right on top of that report to dissect it and figure out what they got right, what they got wrong. Um, and then we'll try to be there to advocate for what was right as it goes through that, that second filter. And then the guidelines should be published early 2021. All right. Would love to have you and Dr. Barnard back. We'll do an entire special just on the guidelines when they start to trickle out in a few weeks. I think that that's going to be really fascinating to see where things are trending. Uh, time now to open up the doctor's mailbag. Dr. Barnard and Susan here now to answer many, many, many of your questions, as many as possible, as a matter of fact, before the end of the show. So go ahead and post yours in the comments section right now. We will get to as many as possible. Dr. Barnard, I want to bring you back because this first question comes to you. It's from Suzanne. She sent this in on Twitter. She writes, I'm seeing reports of new symptoms in pediatric patients similar to Kawasaki's. Have past coronaviruses caused complications like this, or is this unique to COVID-19? Um, okay. Uh, great. First of all, great question. A very timely question. This has been emerging, particularly in, in New York City. Um, for people who don't know what we're talking about, Kawasaki disease is uh, a rather uncommon pediatric condition that's, that's uh, welled up in recent years, and it's a condition of inf inflammation in the blood vessels. And, and affected children often have a fever and redness and a variety of other symptoms that we've talked about here. Uh, a, a new syndrome has emerged with some COVID-19 infected kids. And overall, kids do better, but this new syndrome uh, presents with a fever. And when I say fever, it's um, 38 degrees Celsius. So uh, in Fahrenheit, that would be 100.4 um, so the kids have a fever, it's persistent. Uh, that may be their only symptom at first, but then as time goes on, uh, they'll, they'll have some of these other symptoms that very, make it look a lot like Kawasaki's. Um, this does not seem to have presented itself with prior coronaviruses, but keep in mind that SARS and MERS did not take anywhere near as many victims as COVID-19 has. So we, it, it may well be that they would cause it too, but it just hasn't uh, been recognized. Bottom line, um, we do need to not be blasé about kids because uh, even though they generally do better than adults with COVID-19, and, and even frankly, even if they've got this new uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is what we're concerned about, they generally do well too, but in, in, in 
occasional cases, they do not do well at all. So we need to take it seriously. Susan, this next question comes to you. It's from Lisa. She writes, how many minutes of exercise should we get per week and what types are best when seeking to prevent illnesses such as COVID-19? Yeah, so I think doing um, like 30 minutes of exercise five to every day, five to seven days a week or a little bit more, 45 minutes to an hour, five days a week is good if you're doing something that gets you aerobic. Get, get you a little bit winded is good. So that, that could be fast, brisk walking, that could be running, that could be biking or swimming. Um, I think that's really important for um, a lot of reasons. Um, one, of, one of which is that it is kind of a, um, um, a, a mental de-stressor, if, if nothing else, among a lot of other health benefits. But um, that's key, but I don't want to understate the importance of things like flexibility, and strength training as well. So doing some stretching, some balance work. Um, you can do all these things at one time too, just with something like kind of a vigorous yoga um, and, and do what you can do if you have a medical condition that doesn't allow you to um, bike, run or swim, just f figure out something that is aerobic with your healthcare provider that's safe for you. But again, not to understate the other stuff with the flexibility and the balance. I think they all three kind of work together to make you a healthier person. Dr. Barnard, coming to you for this next one from Andrea on YouTube. She writes, I am a vegetarian transitioning to veganism. I'm on medication for hypothyroidism. Can that be fixed with a plant-based diet? Uh, first of all, congratulations. It's a great choice. Um, there have not been clear studies on this yet, but we're, we're heartened by two things. One is there are a number of people who have been hypothyroid, who have made exactly the change you're describing, where they finally throw out the dairy and they throw out the meat and they get better. When I say better, I mean that their labs, especially a lab called TSH, norm normalizes. Um, how frequently that occurs, we don't know. We just hear of lots of individual cases that have done it. Um, the other reason that we are encouraged about that kind of choice is the Adventist Health Study 2 took a large group of people, more than 60,000 people, and they looked at who was most likely to not have thyroid issues. And as you might imagine, it's people who were not exposed to dairy products or meat. And in fact, the people who did the worst were the people who were lacto-ovo vegetarians. The idea is they're not eating meat, but they're making up for it with cheese and uh, dairy products. So, oh, and by the way, when it comes to hyperthyroidism, the people who do the worst are the people who eat dairy and meat. So um, th there's every reason to go ahead and go to a plant-based diet and see if you don't do better. Don't cancel your doctor's appointment. Don't throw your pills away, uh, but just talk to your doctor. Let your doctor know that you're making this change. And uh, it's an easy matter to track your blood tests and to uh, ratchet you down on your medications or, or stop them and see how you do. Staying with you, Dr. Barnard, this one from Bettina on YouTube. Does it matter how many drops of the virus you get for how ill you become? Is there a connection between the two? Um, again, one of these things that, that we don't exactly know, but the presumption, the presumption is yes, that there would be a connection. Uh, the, the idea, the, the, the rather simple-minded theory that, that people are, assume, are, are assuming is correct is that if you get a very large dose of the virus, uh, you, you were with a person stuck in the elevator for 45 minutes and they are sneezing and coughing and sneezing and coughing and the virus is just invading, that you are more likely to have uh, an illness that overwhelms your immune system than if you just caught one virus uh, drifting in the air and that your white blood cells were able to capture. So the presumption is that dose matters. Susan, this one comes to you from another Susan on Facebook. Flat out, is organic food better? Um, you know, that's interesting. There's not a whole lot of research to point um, us towards saying to making that kind of statement that organic is better uh, because all the research around eating more plants, fruits, vegetables doesn't discern between organic or even necessarily canned or fresh um, or seasonal or local or all those lovely things. It just says eat more fruits and vegetables, eat more grains and beans. So I think the most important thing is just to make sure you're eating those foods, however they have been have been grown um, or however they're stored, whether it's frozen or canned. So making sure you're just eating more. If you are 
thinking about organic versus not organic and the question itself is preventing you from eating those foods at all because you're so concerned about whether it's how it's been grown and you're doing yourself a huge disservice. All that said, do I think um, foods that are grown with or not sprayed with pesticides? I mean, my common sense would say, yeah, that's probably better. Um, but it's but it's but it's not it's not so dangerous per se that you need to not eat foods that are uh, conventional because we know we know that those have benefits. Dr. Barnard, this next question is for you. And I, I love this one so much. I don't even know why, but it just amuses me to no end. It's from Carl on Facebook. He writes, if you were ordering a thin crust pizza without any cheese, what three toppings would you get? <laughs> what three toppings would I put on my cheese? Uh, on, on, my, on my pizza, if, if there were no cheese on there? Yeah, that's right. Okay, great question. Um, well, first of all, you don't ever want to put cheese on your pizza anyway. Uh, and, and by the way, for all, all the people who imagine that pizza cannot be pizza without cheese, once they open the travel restrictions, I want you to get on a plane and go to Rome, Italy, and go into any pizzeria in town, and you will discover that they have pizzas that have never had cheese on them. They've got, they've got two or three of them on every pizzeria menu where they it's, it's crust and it's various toppings, but they never had cheese. So this idea of three-eighths of an inch of yellow asphalt that is obligatory on every pizza, that's kind of an American invention. That's not traditional. Okay, so what are you going to have on top? Well, what could you have on top? Obviously, you could have some spinach. Great choice. Um, if you want to have tomatoes, sun-dried or otherwise, go for it. If you want to go to the allium group with garlic, onions, go for it. And if you want to have olives, that's okay. Because keep in mind, even though olive oil is pretty fatty, the amount of uh, oil in an olive itself, rather modest. So I think that's more than three. I know, I know that you're a jalapeno guy. Would you ever brave putting jalapenos on a pizza? Of course. It's an excellent source of vitamin J. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, By the way, that's a joke. There is no vitamin J. Medical students, if you're watching, this is this will be on the boards. <laughs> there is no vitamin J. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I remember being confused the first time you told me that, too. That took a second, but that is funny. <laughs> um, Susan, this one comes to you from Diva on YouTube. What is the best way to transition to a plant-based diet? That's such a good question right now with so many people curious about it, given the, the connection that we're seeing between these underlying conditions and meat consumption. Everybody just wants to get a little bit healthier. Okay, wait, repeat the first part of the question. I was still, I want the pizza question. But, oh, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> well, go ahead. Give us your pizza toppings first, then we'll talk about transitioning to a plant-based diet. Okay. Um, I'm just kidding. But but actually, my son is a huge advocate of pineapple and black olives on his uh, mm. cheeseless pizzas. So that's what Good we call. eat now. Thanks a lot, kid. <laughs> um, so I'm so sorry, but do repeat the first part of your question. What is the best way to transition to a plant-based diet? Okay. Okay. So I think what I've seen the most success with patients who come into our clinic um, and have no idea what to do is first taking the time to really understand what this looks like, literally in your kitchen, in your refrigerator, in your pantry, um, and getting ready. I think there's just this key week, at least, of big getting educated about what you're going to be eating, how you're going to prepare it, what you like, what you don't like. Because what kind of sets people up oftentimes for failure is they come in so excited. There's a million reasons to do this, right? Environmental reasons, ethical health reasons, and they just want to do it no, ma no matter what. Um, and that's great. But I do think that the last thing you want to do is get to day three and be like, I, I don't even know what to eat anymore. And maybe you eat something that's plant-based, but it's not necessarily very healthy. Um, or you get back into your old rut because you're comfortable there. Um, so get educated, take a week, get educated, and then think not long term, but maybe just think short term. Do this for three weeks. And this is exactly why we have our 21 day kickstart program, which is free online. It's a free app. And that will walk you through 21 days. And that's all we're asking. Just take three weeks and see what happens. So you're going to take that week to get prepared and then take three weeks to do it 100 percent. And. At the end of those three weeks, even though I tell people, yeah, you can do whatever you want after the end of three weeks, 100% of the time, I would say, I'm very confident that people say, I don't want to go back to the way I was eating. This is easy. 
I feel good. I'm full. I'm satisfied. Yet I'm meeting these markers that I was looking to change, whether that be weight or blood pressure or blood glucose, but just energy or skin or whatever, whatever their marker may be, they're going to find um, positive results. So it's very hard to go back. And even though you might trip up a little bit here and there, we always get back on and figure it out. Like we always just need more time to just become experts in this, right? I'm, st I'm still learning things every day. Um, so that would be my, my suggestion is to educate yourself, take three weeks. All right, back to the pizza thing. I see uh, some people are weighing in with their favorite toppings uh, in the comment section. So go ahead and post yours. Let's get some ideas out there. Barb in particular writes, do not underestimate the wonderfulness of broccoli on pizza. Amen to that. Roasted broccoli on pizza is not the worst thing in the world. Speaking of broccoli, uh, Dr. Barnard, this one comes to us from Mimi on YouTube. Are cruciferous veggies best digested cooked or raw? Cooked. Yep. Um <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I know that people have them raw at a crudite platter at a party or something like that, um, but they, they do digest substantially better uh, when they're cooked. And if you have a little digestive upset after you had some broccoli or cauliflower or kale, uh, cook them like crazy and you'll discover they're much more digestible. Sticking with you comes to us from Ka on YouTube. I'm on a plant-based diet and eat a good variety of foods. Do I need zinc supplements? Does he need zinc supplements? That is the question. Uh, no, um, I would not take zinc supplements um, with one exception. Um, if you feel a cold coming on, zinc supplements uh, in the form of, you'll see them commercially as cold ease. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, you see it at the pharmacy. Um, and, you, and you do take that and it will shorten the cold, that's true. But the reason we don't normally recommend that people take zinc supplements unless their doctor has specifically uh, requested it is that zinc can be toxic and overdose. And when you're taking too much, it can actually impair immune function. All right, Susan, coming back to you, this one from DL on YouTube. I slide back into transition foods because of a lack of time for cooking. Are there any transition foods without oil that you know of? Well, I think um, when it comes to transition foods, and I, I, I suspect that DL means things like the fake deli meats or the tofu hot dogs and things like that, sauce, plant-based sausages. I think the most important aspect when you're consuming those products is to check the total fat content. So if the fat content, total fat, it's right there on the label, is less than three grams per serving, that's not a bad one to choose. So I think if you favor those, you don't need to get caught up in necessarily um, the ingredient list per se, but just go for the total fat, less than three grams. That's a pretty good transition food until you can transition over to um, more whole foods like beans, um, which are, or, or if you can find burgers that are just made with beans. So your veggie burger is uh, a, a bean burger, something that you can actually see the food in, in the burger and you know what it is. That's a really good option as well. All right, time for just a couple of more. Uh, R. Carter, Dr. Barnard, on YouTube is wondering about toxins, wants to know, is there a safe, high-quality non-stick pan for cooking plant-based foods without any oil? Yeah, um, great, great, great question. Um, first of all, what do you want to your, your pan to do? You, you, the reason you're thinking about a non-stick pan, I presume, is because if our parents or our grandparents were cooking things in their fry pan, they would throw um, some butter in there or fat back or lots of grease and that permeates the food. And so you want to get away from that. Um, but then uh, back in the 1970s, you bought a Teflon pan that was uh, chipping all over the place and, and you were wondering what's happening if you're ingesting the Teflon. Um, the modern day pans are a new generation. They're much better. Um, the surfaces tend not to chip uh, and, and can be fine. The other, con the other consideration though, is what's the layer underneath the nonstick coating. And for some of them, it's aluminum. And I'm frankly concerned about that because of the evidence linking aluminum to Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, stay tuned. We need more research on that. But I, for one, don't want to be in the experimental group on it. So what that means is you want a pan that's got a good nonstick surface at the top. And then the layer underneath the nonstick surface should be steel. Um, uh, after that, there might be aluminum, but don't have it be aluminum as your top layer underneath, uh, right underneath the uh, nonstick. At least that's my view. Where are you going to find it? Um, I just saw actually a good one uh, by, there's a, a brand called Made In, 
as in made in America. Uh, for about 99 bucks, you can get a, a quite a good one. You can order it online. Uh, but actually, Chuck, you didn't ask me this, but if you don't mind, I'm going to tell you how to take care of your pan because I learned this the hard way. I got a really nice Demeyer pan about a year ago and it worked great and, and it met exactly the specifications I had. And within about two months, it was dead. It wasn't nonstick anymore at all. And here's what I did wrong. And first of all, don't add any oil to it at all. If, if you're adding any, like even a, a spritz of pan uh, to it, it starts to kind of bake into the surface and destroys the nonstick part. Secondly, don't use anything abrasive on it to clean it. Use literally a sponge and that's it. Nothing, nothing more than that, not even a gritty sponge. Um, third, don't give it a thermo shock. So if it's hot on the stove, do not put it in the sink. L leave it, just sit there uh, on an on turned off burner, let it cool down and then you can uh, clean it. And finally, when you store it, if you're storing it, stacking things up, put a towel on top so that other things don't chip into it. If you do those, you can get a nice uh, pan that'll last you a really good long time. Yeah, I had no idea that they were such delicate objects. I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna go implement that. I'm gonna use a dish towel in between my pans so they don't chip away. Yeah. Uh, final question, Dr. Barnard, is one that I think a lot of people have been wondering. Growing up, they eat dairy, they experience this. Emma on Facebook wants to know how does dairy affect sinus issues, and does all dairy affect sinuses the same way? Uh, we think it's probably the dairy protein that seems to do it. So in other words, um, you might be having whole milk or non-fat milk. Either way, you, you may find that you're reacting because the, the reaction in this case is to the protein rather than the fat. The dairy fat is the one that raises your cholesterol, but it may be the dairy protein that you're reacting to. Um, many people have this experience that when they get away from dairy, their sinuses clear up, their allergies are better. Um, even other things like a cat allergy somehow isn't so bad. Uh, it doesn't affect you so much when the dairy is out of your diet. Now, I have not seen particularly good quality studies on this, I have to say, but the experience of, of this is so commonly reported. And because dairy is totally unnecessary, I encourage people to just experiment in their own lives. If you've got asthma, for sure. If you have seasonal allergies, uh, uh, or frankly, for anything else, just get away from dairy and give it a good two, three months being, being scrupulous. Don't have a little bit of cheese when you go out because that's going to throw off your, your observations. Just get away from dairy completely. See how you do. All right. That's all the time that we have for the mailbag today. But here's what you guys may not realize is that we actually save every question that you send in and we may get an opportunity to circle back to it in a future episode. So keep on posting them. And you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at Chuck Carroll WLC at PCRM on Twitter and then at Physicians Committee on Instagram. You can send your questions there as well. Just make sure that you use the hashtag exam room podcast. And before we go, Dr. Barnard, quick plug tomorrow at 2.30 Eastern time, right back here, man, we're going to do a world premiere for your new music video. Everything's all right. I'm looking forward to this. We're going to have some fun. You know, it's, it's um, Memorial Day weekend is kicking off. And I don't know about you, but people I'm talking to are all stressed out and so forth. So you and I are going to have some fun. And uh, our musicians from Carbon Works are going to reveal not only this really lovely song called It's, it's a Lullaby, but a cute video that goes along with it. So that's 2.30. Um, and then at 3 o'clock, we're doing it all in French, if you can believe it, because one of our singers uh, sang it in French. So we're going to uh, do that one, too. So we're going to have a lot of fun. So that's 2.30 tomorrow. I guarantee. Matter of fact, I will issue a bet you can't smile challenge. I will bet you a kale chip that you can't watch this video without cracking a smile. And Susan, I also wanted to ask real quick how things are going over at the Barnard Medical Center. Again, we talk so much about high blood pressure on this show and the connection with diet and hypertension. And you and I, as a matter of fact, did a great episode of the Exam Room podcast just earlier this week all about high blood pressure and food. So really quickly, if somebody is interested in working with you about lowering their own blood pressure, what can they expect? Well, if they come to the clinic virtually, of course, you can expect to learn how to eat well on a plant-based diet, how to do it um, healthfully, easily. Um, just make an appointment to speak with any of our clinicians or dietitians. And if you're in one of the states where we are licensed to, to practice, um, we will be so happy to talk to you and get you healthy from the comfort of your couch. 
It's it's really fantastic. It is truly the 21st century doctor's house call or dietitian house call, if you will. So to make your appointment, log on right now, barnardmedical.org, or you can pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500. You see that web address and the phone number on the screen. Available to patients in Arizona, Colorado, California, Washington, D.C., Massachusetts, Maryland, Missouri, New York, Virginia, and not listed, but guaranteed to be there, the great state of Kentucky as as well. If you live in any one of those places, barnardmedical.org is the website for you to make your appointment and stay tuned because there are new states coming online all of the time. But for today, that is all the time that we have. So my thanks to everyone here at the exam room live, our wonderful director, Emily Cologne and producer, Laura Anderson. We could not have done this show without you today. For Dr. Neil Barnard and Susan Levin and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching. And until tomorrow, keep it plant-based. <laughs>